First Chronicles 18 verse 1 Now after this it came to pass that David smote the Philistines and subdued them and took Gath and her towns out of the hand of the Philistines and he smote Moab and the Moabites became David's servants and brought gifts and David smote Hadareza king of Zobar unto Hamath as he went to establish his dominion by the river Euphrates and David took from him a thousand chariots and seven thousand horsemen and twenty thousand footmen David also hocked all the chariot horses but reserved of them an hundred chariots when the Syrians of Damascus came to help Hadareza king of Zobah David slew of the Syrians two and twenty thousand men then David put garrisons in Syria Damascus and the Syrians became David's servants and brought gifts thus the Lord preserved David whithersoever he went and David took the shields of gold that were on the servants of Hadareza and brought them to Jerusalem likewise from Tibhath and from Chun cities of Hadareza brought David very much brass wherewith Solomon made the brazen sea and the pillars and the vessels of brass now when Tohu king of Hamath heard how David had smitten all the host of Hadareza king of Zobah he sent Hadoram his son to King David to inquire of his welfare and to congratulate him because he had fought against Hadareza and smitten him for Hadareza had war with Tohu and with him all manner of vessels of gold and silver and brass them also King David dedicated unto the Lord with the silver and the gold that he brought from all these nations from Edom and from Moab and the children of Ammon and from the Philistines and from Amalek moreover Abishai the son of Zeruiah slew of the Edomites in the valley of salt 18,000 and he put garrisons in Edom and all the Edomites became David's servants thus the Lord preserved David whithersoever he went just want to look at things that are preserved by God tonight three things that are preserved by God first of all we're going to think about his saints and then we'll think for a little while about his city and finally we'll think about his scriptures things preserved by God his saints his scriptures sorry his city and his scriptures now twice in the reading we had you will have perhaps noticed twice we found the sentence uh, in verse 6 and at the verse 13 thus the Lord preserved David whithersoever he went and we've just read this chapter of the many nations that uh, David did battle with uh, many of them and of course they we see them all falling to David and, and in the midst of all this warfare we read that the Lord preserved David whithersoever he went we find the account of this also in the second book of Samuel and there also twice it's recorded that the Lord preserved David with us ever he went now repeatedly David was in mortal danger but this explains to us why he was never killed because the Lord preserved David with us ever he went um, have a look at Leviticus 26 if you will for a moment or two Leviticus 26 Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, so it's the third book in your Bible. And verse 7, the Lord says via Moses to the people of Israel, And ye shall chase your enemies, and they shall fall before you by the sword. And five of you shall chase an hundred, and an hundred of you shall put ten thousand to flight, and your enemies shall fall before you by the sword. For I will have respect unto you and make you fruitful and multiply you and establish my covenant with you. So the Lord here promises Israel tremendous victories in their battle. And the reason they can have tremendous victories is because he says in verse 9, For I will have respect unto you. Therefore, uh, when the Lord was with them, they profited in battle. And when the Lord was against them, they fell in battle. 
Now, I don't know about you, I'm a fairly patriotic Englishman, and uh, we all hear stories about what a marvellous fighting unit the SAS is, the Special Air Service. Uh, I've been told, you know, since I was a young lad that it's the best fighting army in the world. Well, of course, Englishmen would say that, wouldn't they? I don't know whether it's true or not. Um, I dare say if you spoke to American, he'd say it was the Navy SEALs. And uh, it, I suppose it depends who you ask. But they're certainly a tough bunch of guys, there's no question about that. They are hard men. And uh, very skillful, I guess, well trained. Um, and, you know, we might feel, maybe, we might feel proud of our SAS. Uh, but even they are utterly helpless if God judges our nation according to its deserts. There are those you can find, if you know where to look, that are complaining about the dismantling of our military, and it's going on, and it's going on a pace. Um, I don't think Brexit's going to happen, personally. I think it's a scam. Uh, I can't go into that tonight. We don't have a load of politics here. We could talk about it over food if you wish, and I'll tell you why. Um, but our military is being slowly, stealthily, and subtly disbanded and united with the French and united with the Germans and so on. Um, and the reason I think this is the case is because we have abused, our government has abused our military power in lands where we had no business. That's what my, my personal view. Nevertheless, if the people of Britain honoured the Lord, as we ought to do, schoolgirls could beat Al-Qaeda with beanbags. That's what I think. If we honoured the Lord, as we should do, schoolgirls could beat Al-Qaeda Al with beanbags. Have a look at Proverbs chapter 28. Proverbs chapter 28. Verse 1. Proverbs 28, verse 1. The wicked flee when no man pursueth, but the righteous are bold as a lion. The wicked flee when no man pursueth, but the righteous are bold as a lion. Why are the righteous bold as a lion? Because they trust that the Lord will be with them. David no doubt went forth in his battles, as when Hezekiah withstood uh, the king of Assyria, I think it was probably Sennacherib. They trusted in the Lord. David had so many victories because he was a man of God and he trusted in the Lord. And he'd seen this even as a shepherd, as you know, he told Saul that he'd slain a bear and he'd slain a lion. And just as he killed those, he would kill the Goliath, which he did. Now the Apostle Paul also was sure that God would preserve him. Let's have a look at 2 Timothy, please. 2 Timothy, chapter 4. Verse 17. 2 Timothy 4, verse 17. Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me, and strengthen me, that by me the preaching might be fully known, and that all the Gentiles might hear, and I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work, and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom, to whom be glory for ever and ever. Uh, I was given a, a CD recently by a brother who was preaching on it, uh, there were two preachers on it. One was a black country man by the sound of him, who was very warm and, and keen and so forth, but rather a garbled message. The other one was very, very well presented and very intellectual, uh, and it was interesting to listen to. But when he came to the end, he didn't appear to be sure whether salvation was eternal or not. But Paul had no doubts about that. God will preserve me, he said, unto his heavenly kingdom. How could Paul be so sure? Because he knew that God will preserve all his saints for Christ's sake. Have a look at Jude for a moment. That's your penultimate book. Uh, that means the last but one, Chris. <laughs> the penultimate, penultimate book in your Bible, Jude. Book of Jude, or the letter of Jude, it's just one chapter, of course, and the first verse. 
Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. Preserved in Jesus Christ. So this was what Paul was sure of. And we can read about the ground of this assurance in, in uh, Romans 8. Let's have a look there for a moment. Romans 8. And verse 31. Letter to the Romans, chapter 8, verse 31. What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress? or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword. As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long, we are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Now, preservation in the New Testament is not always from suffering or death, as we've just read here. It is from wickedness and from judgment. That's the, that's the most important preservation. Um, you know, some of the old godly saints used to say, I would rather die than do so and so, and they meant it. And we should hate sin so much that we would rather die than be involved in sin, deep sin, real dreadful sin. So preservation in the New Testament is not always from suffering or death. There were those uh, in the churches in Asia. I can't remember quite which church it was. It might have been Smyrna. And the Lord warns them that some of them will die, he said, but um, don't worry about that. He warned his disciples, don't, don't fear those who take your life but can't take your soul. So the real preservation, the most important preservation that God's concerned about is that we're preserved from wickedness and from sin. Preserved to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ whether we live or die. As Paul say, as says and we read together in 2 Timothy, he will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom. Now when faith comes in, fear goes out. Um, we hear an awful lot don't we about terrorism and uh, murders and so on and so forth and uh, I do feel that much of this newscasting and broadcasting and so forth is designed to make us fearful I believe the purpose is to make the populace fearful but when faith comes in fear goes out the righteous are bold as a lion, says the Bible. And if the Lord is pleased to preserve you today, there is not a man on earth, not a man on earth, can do anything about that. And we ought to walk in that kind of assurance. They used to say, a man's immortal till his work's done. And if we're about God's business, we are immortal until that work is done. Sometimes, perhaps, our faith falters. We remember on one occasion when David was being pursued by Saul and he was afraid of Saul, he said, I think it was to Jonathan, surely there is but a step between me and death. Now this was before he became king. He didn't die till he was 70, so it was a big step, wasn't he? You know, David thought, he got fearful, and he thought, Saul's going to get him one of these days, Saul's going to get me, surely there's but a step between me and death, but there, there wasn't. The Lord preserved David with us every he went. He lived to the ripe old age in those days, the ripe old age of 70. Surprising how young uh, some of the folks were. I mean, of course, we know in the earliest days prior to the flood, men lived for hundreds and hundreds of years. But after the times of Abraham, those, that longevity began to shrink. 
I think of Hezekiah, King Hezekiah. God told him when he was about 38, put your house in order, you're going to die. And Isaiah turned his face to the wall and he wept and he asked God to heal him. And God said, I'll give you, 50, I'll give you 15 more years. So Hezekiah died when he was 53. You find other kings. There were some that lived quite, quite long. But many of them lived a lot less than we do now. Um, there was a great preacher in the days of the Reformation in this country called Hugh Latimer. I believe he was the Bishop of Worcester. I always remember we had a guy come in, he was a church historian, he used to teach church history at Bible College and he used to come to us now and again to preach at two morning and evening at, at a church in Birmingham. Um, George Ashdown is with the Lord now. And um, I, can't, I can't remember what I was going to tell you about him now. That <laughs> Now, now I told you who he was, I forgot what he said. Oh, that was a senior moment. We might, we might, if I remember that, I'll tell you. <laughs> uh, oh yeah, that's right, we're talking about Hugh Latimer. <laughs> talking about Hugh Latimer. Um, and I still forgot what George, <laughs> what George Ashton had to say about him. But Hugh Latimer was, was the Bishop of Worcester, and uh, he was burned at the stake by Bloody Mary in 1555. And you can see the spot in Oxford, it's actually, amazingly, amazingly, they've actually got a stone in the wall saying Latimer and Ridley were burned here, and you can go and see it's in Broad Street in Oxford. And amazingly, just around the corner, outside St John's College, there's what they call the Oxford Memorial, and there's three men on there, that's Latimer, Ridley and Cranmer, who were all burned, 1555 and 1566, by Bloody Mary, and Ridley and Cranmer were burned back to back, but Ridley was a great preacher, and George Ashdown told us, there we go, it's come back to me now, that Riddler, Lat Latimer used to preach in the street, he had an hourglass, and he'd preach for an hour, and the people would shout, turn the glass, Master Ridley, turn the glass, Master Latimer, turn the glass. They would have had another hour. That must have been some preaching. Just people who stood in the street, they'd listen for an hour, and they'd say, turn the glass, Master Latimer. He was a man of God. But he said this, and it was in a letter to Ridley. Pray for me, I say, pray for me, for I am sometimes so fearful that I would creep into a mouse hole. Sometimes God doth visit me again with his comforts, so he cometh and goeth to teach me to feel and to know my infirmity. And sometimes God just draws away a little bit and leaves us just a little bit to flounder that we might re realise that without him we can do nothing as the Lord teaches us in this is John 15 apart from me, without me you can do nothing. And this has been my experience too sometimes the Lord moves away they used to put a sign up outside churches uh, if God seems far away who moved and what they want you think was obviously you but it's not always the case it can be God sometimes he moves away for his own purposes and that's what Ridley that's what Latim is talking about let's run a few more references on the preservation of the saints and then we'll look at the preservation of the city look with me at Psalm 41 Psalm 41 Verse 1. Blessed is he that considereth the poor. The Lord will deliver him in time of trouble. The Lord will preserve him and keep him alive. And he shall be blessed upon the earth that they would not deliver him unto the will of his enemies. And then let's just go back to, in fact, let's stay in the psalm for a moment. Go to Psalm 37. Psalm 37 and verse 28 For the Lord loveth judgment and forsaketh not his saints they are preserved forever but the seed of the wicked shall be cut off and Psalm 31 Psalm 31 and verse 23 O oh, love the Lord, all ye his saints, for the Lord preserveth the faithful and plentifully rewardeth the proud doer. And just back a few books to Joshua, to the left, 
to the book of Joshua and chapter 24 and verse 17 verse 17 Joshua 24 for the Lord our God he it is that brought us up and our fathers out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage and which did those great signs in our sight and preserved us in all the way wherein we went and among all the people through whom we passed. You remember the story, of course, as they came out of Egypt and they crossed the Red Sea and they wandered in the wilderness for all those years. When the spies were sent up to spy out the land from the wilderness, a place called Kadesh Barnea, they came back, as one man said, well, ten of them came back saying it's hopeless. And two of them said, Joshua and Caleb, we can go, the Lord's with us, we can go and take these nations. And uh, one man said, you know, I've said to you before, ten came back, two came back with the grapes and ten came back with the gripes. And um, they, they thought the situation was hopeless. And so the, what the Lord did, he said, all the men, uh, and they complained that they, they were going to take their children in there and their children were going to perish. So the Lord said, all you men, you will die in the wilderness and I will take your children in. And that's exactly what happened. That's exactly what happened. So the Lord was very specific about who he preserved and whom he destroyed. I said to you last time I was preaching, didn't I? Was it here or was it Quinton? You won't find the word accident in the Bible. Get a concordance, look it up. You won't even find it in NIV. That's probably an accident. But you won't find accident in there or in the KJV. Um, Matthew 10 and we'll look at this one again in a different context later but let's have a look at Matthew 10 and verse 28 Matthew's Gospel chapter 10 verse 28 and fear not them which kill the body but are not able to kill the soul but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. That's a reference to the Lord, of course, and not to the devil. Verse 29, Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing? And one of them should not fall on the ground without your father, but the very hairs of your head are all numbered. God's able to preserve us. So first of all, then, we see that God preserves his saints. Secondly, we're going to consider that God preserves his city. And of course, this is Jerusalem. Those of us who know the Bible, perhaps even passing acquaintance with it, know that Jerusalem became the capital city of Israel. And that happened in about 1000 BC, when David took the throne. Now the first king of Israel, of course, was Saul. He was of the tribe of Benjamin, and he... And he uh, was rejected and after him came David and David was the first uh, well I suppose it's not really right to say he was the first king in a sense he was the second uh, but through the line of David came all the following kings of Judah and of course the Lord Jesus is of the tribe of David now David began to reign around about a thousand BC and Jerusalem was made his capital at first David was the king in Hebron but then all Israel made him king and he, and he took the city called Jebus, uh, which was a fortified city, um, naturally a city of the, of the Jeb Jebusites as they're called, uh, and they mocked David. Have a look at First Chronicles chapter 11. First Chronicles chapter 11 and verse 4. First Chronicles 11 verse 4 And David and all Israel went to Jerusalem which is Jebus where the Jebusites were the inhabitants of the land and the inhabitants of Jebus said to David thou shalt not come hither nevertheless David took the castle of Zion which is the city of David and David said whosoever smiteth the Jebusites first shall be chief and captain so Joab the son of Zeruiah went first up and was chief and David dwelt in the castle therefore they called it the city of David and he built the city round about even from Millo round about and Joab repaired the rest of the city so Jerusalem was originally called Jebus and it was a city of the Jebusites 
have a look at uh, Judges chapter 19. They're going to left a few books to Judges chapter 19. Verse 10. But the man would not tell it that night, but he rose up and departed and came over against Jebus, which is Jerusalem. And there were with him two asses saddled, his concubine also was with him. And they, when they were by Jebus, the day was far spent. And the servant said unto him, Master, come, I pray thee, and let us turn in into the city of the Jebusites and lodge in it. And his master said unto him, We will not turn aside hither into the city of a stranger that is not of the children of Israel. We will pass over to Gibeah. So at that point there, and certainly at the time when David went up against it, it was occupied by the Jebusites and they were not Israelites. Um, Benjamin, when Joshua took the, took the tribes in, it was Benjamin that was allocated Jebus, uh, but they never took it. Um, go to Joshua 18, please. Joshua chapter 18. Joshua chapter 18, two verses. Verse 21. Now the cities of the tribe of the children of Benjamin, according to their families, were Jericho and Beth Hogla and the valley of Kizis. And then the cities are listed down through several verses. And look at verse 28. And Zela, sorry, and Zela, Eleth, and Jebusai, which is Jerusalem, Gibeath and Kirjath, 14 cities with their villages. This is the inheritance of the children of Benjamin according to their family. So Benjamin, when the land was divided, Benjamin should have taken Jebus, but they didn't. Have a look at uh, Judges again, please. Chapter 1. That's the next book after Joshua. Judges chapter 1. And verse 21. Judges 1. 21. And the children of Benjamin did not drive out the Jebusites that inhabited Jerusalem. But the Jebusites dwell with the children of Benjamin in Jerusalem until this day. So clearly, little tip here that the book of Judges was written, must have been written after David had taken Jerusalem. Um, because they were, they were, by this time, it's, it's writing, they were, they were side by side, but at first... Uh, it was just the Jebusites. Now the Jebusites were descended from Canaan and they were one of the ten nations that the Lord, the ten Gentile nations or Canaanite nations that the Lord told Israel and told Abraham they were going to drive out. He told Abraham that he was going to have that land and he names the ten nations of Canaan and Jebusites was one of them. And when the, Jeb when the, uh, the Israelites, the spies, went up from Kadesh Barnea from the wilderness that I mentioned earlier, they came back with what the Bible calls their evil report. We can't do it. And amongst other things, they said that Jebusites dwell in the mountains. And uh, I looked at the uh, modern atlas today, and Jerusalem appears to be two to 3,000 feet above sea level. I've never been there, but that's, that's according to my, uh, my map book. Now, uh, Dr. E.W. Bullinger, uh, who died in around about 1917, was the secretary of the Trinitarian Bible Society, a great student of the Bible. One or two strange ideas, uh, soul sleep and uh, bipartite nature of man. Uh, but nevertheless, a very helpful uh, commentator. He lists 27 times that the nation of that the city of Jerusalem was besieged from the very first time it happened, uh, recorded in the Bible. And he lists all 27 occasions of the various sieges of Jerusalem and lists those in which the city fell and those in which it did not. Um, the city of Jerusalem, its name was changed by Hadrian. You know Hadrian that built the wall to stop the entry, empties rolling into England. Well, he also took a... So just slip that one in. Uh, he took on a guy who led a rebellion called Bar Kokhba, and the, the, many of the Jews believe that Bar Kokhba was the Messiah, around right about AD 135. And after Adrian defeated Bar Kokhba and his followers, um, he changed the name of Jerusalem to Ilia Capitolinus. But it's still called Jerusalem today, so that didn't last 
Uh, Bullinger says it was about 200 years, it was called Aelia Capitolinus, and as a real insult, uh, Hadrian built a temple to Jupiter on the site of the Holy of Holies. Apparently, Bullinger says, in the days of Hadrian, after he defeated Bar Cockburn and the Jewish rebellion, there was a toast that they used to give at Roman feasts. Hiero Solima est perdita. Jerusalem is destroyed. Hiero Solima est perdita. That's H-E-P, and it was reduced to HEP. And they used to say, HEP, HEP, hooray. HEP, HEP, hooray. According to Bullinger, that's the origin. So next time somebody says three cheers, if you love the Lord and you care about Jerusalem, just don't cheer. Uh, you know, I'm not going to do it. We were, when we went to the theatre recently, uh, we watched this play and this guy came out at the end, a typical lover, you know, acting type dude, with slightly long and wavy hair, came out with a flourish. And he was telling us about one of the guys that had been a producer at the Shakespeare Company for years and years, and he died the day before. And he said to us, uh, let's give him a round of applause. Well, I'm not about to applaud a dead man. I don't know whether anybody noticed, but I'm not about to applaud a dead man. And I'm not about to shout hip hip hooray anymore either, because I'm not pleased about the destruction of Jerusalem, though the Romans were. Whether you join in, that's your business. Under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, the psalmist writes, If I forget thee, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget her cunning. Turn to Psalm 137. Psalm 137, verse 6, sorry, it's verse 5. Psalm 137, verse 5. If I forget thee, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget her cunning. If I do not remember thee, let my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth. If I prefer not to Jerusalem above my chief joy. This is the psalmist writing, of course, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Go to Isaiah chapter 49. Isaiah, precious, precious passage here, beautiful. Prophetic and just tells us something of the love of God for the nation of Israel and for Jerusalem. Remember the Lord Jesus wept over Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, he said, how often I would have gathered thee unto me as a hen gathered her chicks, but she would not. He wept, he saw the city, says the word, and he wept over it. But have a look at Isaiah 49. And verse 13. Sing, O heavens, and be joyful, O earth, and break forth into singing, O mountains, for the Lord hath comforted his people, and will have mercy upon his afflicted. But Zion said, The Lord hath forsaken me, and my Lord hath forgotten me. Can a woman forget her sucking child? that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb. Yea, they may forget, yet will I not forget thee. Behold, I have graven thee upon the palms of my hands. Thy walls are continually before me. Makes you think of the cross, doesn't it? I have graven thee upon the palms of my hands. Thy walls are always or continually before me. He's speaking about Jerusalem, called Zion in verse 14, as it often is. And have a look at Isaiah chapter 31. Isaiah chapter 31. And verse 3. Now the Egyptians are men and not God and their horse is flesh and not spirit when the lord shall stretch out his hand both he that helpeth shall fall and he that is holpen shall fall down and they shall fall together they shall they all shall fall together for thus hath the lord spoken unto me like as the lion and the young lion roaring on his prey when a multitude of shepherds is called forth against him he will not be afraid of their voice nor abase himself for the noise of them makes me comes to mind again the righteous are bold as a lion so shall the lord of hosts come down to fight for mount zion and for the hill thereof as birds flying so will the lord of hosts defend jerusalem defending also he will deliver it and passing over he will preserve it this of course is a reference to the second coming 
have a look at Zechariah chapter 14. Zechariah, so it's right, you're in the Minor Prophets, you're almost back towards the end of your Old Testament. Just the, it's the last but one book before Malachi, Prophet Zechariah chapter 14. Verse 1, Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. And the city shall be taken, and the houses rightful, and the women ravished. And half of the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then shall the Lord go forth, and fight against those nations, as when he fought in the day of battle. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west. And there shall be a very great valley, and half of the mountain shall remove toward the north, and half of it toward the south. And ye shall flee to the valley of the mountains, for the valley of the mountains shall reach unto Azel. Yea, ye shall flee like as ye fled from before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. And the Lord my God shall come, and all the saints with thee, and then look also, if you will, to verse 8. And it shall be in that day that living waters shall go out from Jerusalem, half of them toward the former sea, and half of them toward the hinder sea. In summer and in winter shall it be. And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day shall there be one Lord, and his name one. All the land shall be turned as a plain, from Geba to Rimmon, south of Jerusalem. And it shall be lifted up and inhabited in a place from Benjamin's gate, unto the place of the first gate, unto the corner gate, and from the tower of Hananiel unto the king's wine presses. And so we read there, Jerusalem shall be safely inhabited. Of course, Jerusalem is very much a political hot potato right now. I've been quite shocked, actually. I, I, I've only just noticed it recently, but I have to go to Alan Rock a fair bit to pick up pupils, a number of Asian pupils. And you'd be quite surprised how many Palestinian flags are flying in Alam Rock and in Small Heath. Um, many, many Muslims, of course, have a real problem even with the very existence of Israel, not just in Palestine, but over here too. And Jerusalem was very much a hot potato. You remember re very recently Trump called it the capital of Israel. And that called a furore. And then Netanyahu s saying uh, that the Bible says so. And a few people thought that was funny. Uh, but we find it in the Bible and surely we're drawing to close to the fulfilment of the prophecy concerning Israel. Of course this is all spiritualised by the Romanists and the Calvinists. The Romanists are very much power seekers and they wanted the, the Church of Rome to be considered the city so they changed everything into Rome and the Church and it's just spiritualising it until it becomes nonsense. Jerusalem is what it meant and it's still there It'll be there when the Lord comes and he'll save it. God will preserve Jerusalem and the Lord Jesus shall soon take his throne there. Perhaps we should take heed to the, to the exhortation in Psalm 122 and verse 6 which says pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Uh, I, I haven't got it, it's over there. I, I brought a book a while back uh, by a man called Bill Grady who's a US preacher and he's written some great books on uh, the history of America from a bibl biblical perspective. And he says in his book, um, you, you America's Bible Belt is Israel's safety belt. And he tells the story of how, and I'll be brief here, uh, but it illustrates God's care, I think, for Jerusalem and for the Jews and for that city. That in 1991, when President George Herbert Walker Bush was president, they arranged a, a confab over the land, Palestine and Israel, in Madrid. And uh, Bush was in favour, of course, of taking more land away from Israel. So Bush went on the 30th of October 1991 to this meeting, this conference in, in Madrid, which was the purpose of, of, I guess, taking land away from Israel. While he was over there, the perfect storm happened in America on the on the uh, on the east coast, and uh, you've seen you may have seen the film, The Perfect Storm, and it wiped Bush's house off the map. He had a big fancy house in Kennebunkport. When he came back from his doing Madrid, it was a wreck. It was just a wreck, and he was filmed 
uh, you know, walking through the rubble, lamenting the loss of all his goods and so forth. And apparently the newspapers carried the two stories side by side. President Bush's trip to Madrid, the land for peace negotiations, and side by side, the perfect storm. Strangely, a year later, 1992, August 23rd, I think I'm right, Bush organised another land for peace conference um, in Washington. Same again, a massive storm wrought absolute devastation on the west coast of America. Even just, you know, all the wind measuring instruments just blew them away. They, they said it got up to at least 175 miles per hour. But we couldn't measure it after that because it blew all the monitors away. The same day, again, the newspapers on the 24th, one side of the page, the, the land for peace negotiations, same page, front page, the great storm that had come down the west coast. Maybe God was trying to tell the president something. One wonders whether Trump's got the message, but Bush didn't appear to be listening. So thirdly, we'll come on and finally to God's preserving his scriptures. We've read that the Lord preserved David whithersoever he went. Paul also said the Lord will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom. Now if this is true of God's messengers, how much more true must it be of his message? If it's true of David and it's true of Paul, if God preserves these men who live in David's case, fight and in Paul's case, preach for the glory of God, if God's prepared to preserve those messengers wherever they go, how much more is he going to preserve the message that they preach? If God takes such care to preserve David and Paul, he cannot take less care over preserving his word. Let's look again for a moment at Matthew 10, which we read earlier. <clears throat> Matthew 10. And verse 30. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. We know us men that as the years go by the number goes down. But they're numbered nevertheless. And if God takes such care, if he knows you and I so well, does he not also know which are his words and where they are to be found? And who are stealing them and who are preserving them? I meant to look up the procedures that the Jews used to go to to preserve the scriptures. They were so careful, those Jews, in looking after the Old Testament text. They used to count the letters, they used to count the consonants and so forth. They used to mark the margins with the numbers. So, so careful about looking after the word of God. In that place, Matthew 10, we read about the Lord caring for the sparrow. And if you take such care for the sparrow, how much more precious, I say, are his words. The messenger is no messenger without a message. Plain reason tells us, before we look at the scriptures, plain reason tells us that God will preserve his word amidst all dangers. And of course, the scriptures say so. Let's go to Psalm 12. Psalm 12. Verse 1. Help, Lord, for the godly man ceaseth, for the faithful fail from among the children of men. How up to date is this? They speak vanity, every one, with his neighbour. With flattering lips and with a double heart do they speak. The Lord shall cut off all flattering lips and the tongue that speaketh proud things, who have said, With our tongue will we prevail. Our lips are our own. Who is Lord over us? For the oppression of the poor, for the signing of the needy, now will I arise, saith the Lord. I will set him in safety from him that puffeth at him. The words of the Lord are pure words, a silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. The wicked walk on every side when the vilest men are exalted. Now the first half of this psalm is contrasted with the second half. Verses 1 through 5 is contracted, contrasted with verses 6 through 8. Verses 1 through 5 is the words of men. Verse 2, they speak vanity. We read of flattering lips in verse 2. Verse 3, we read of flattering lips again. 
and proud things. Verse 4, with our tongue will we prevail, our lips are our own. So we're reading about the words of men in the first part of the psalm. That's being contrasted then with the words of the Lord, pure words, um, in the second half of the psalm. So let's just contrast these for a moment. Verse 2 we read, they speak vanity. The words of men are vain. That is to say they are light, they are worthless and they're superficial. But not God's word. God's word is weighty. We can contrast them, can't we? God's word is weighty, it's precious and it's full of substance. Verse 2 we read of flattering lips. Not so God's words. God tells the truth. There's no flattery in the Bible. There might be flattering preachers in pulpits, but they never got their flattery out of the Bible. Not my Bible, anyway. Not yours, if you've got a KJV. Verse 3 speaks of proud things. The tongue that speaketh proud things. Again, not so God's words. The words of God will have a humbling effect. With our tongue will we prevail, he says in verse 4. Now, success gotten by lies, and some men do get the measure of success by lies, will be short-lived. My mum used to say to me when I was a little lad, uh, honesty is the best policy. I don't know whether she was always honest, but she used to say that much, and at least about that she was right, and I still believe that. Success gotten by lies will be short-lived. That is only real success which is built upon the word of God. Our lips are our own, verse 4. In other words, we, we say what we like. Who is Lord over us? We, we can say what we like because there's no God. We can say what we like because we're never going to be judged for it. Our lips are our own. Who is Lord over us? But the Bible's message is the Lord's and believers should speak God's words. There's no fantasy, just truth and wholesomeness in the word of God. And so we come to verse 6. The words of the Lord are pure. There is no alloy. It, there is all good in them. Look at Psalm 119 verse 14. I should be finishing soon. Try not to sigh with relief. Psalm 119 verse 140. Psalm 119 verse 140. Thy word is very pure. Therefore thy servant loveth it. Thy word is very pure. Psalm 119 verse 140. Thy word is very pure. Therefore thy servant loveth it. And Proverbs chapter 30. And verse 5. Every word of God is pure. He is your shield, shield unto them that put their trust in him. So going back to Psalm 12, verse 7, here's the preservation promise, Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Now the context of verse 7 is verse 6. The last thing to be spoken of, the antecedent, when we have the pronoun them in verse 7, you know what a pronoun is? A pronoun is a word you put in the place of a noun. So instead of saying, that's Derek over there, I might say him over there, that's Derek, and him stands for Derek, it's a pronoun. And a pronoun has an antecedent, that's what that, the noun that the pronoun refers to. And the antecedent of verse 7, I believe, is verse 6, the words of the Lord. And here in our King James Bible, we are told then that God will preserve his words. Modern Bibles remove that promise. Oh, that's hardly surprising, really. Because they don't really believe in the preservation of the word of God. They'll change it willy-nilly. They translate the thing out and they make it apply instead to verse 5, the oppression of the poor and the needy. They say it's the, the poor and needy that the Lord will keep, not the worse. The Saviour says in Matthew 24 and verse 35, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words, not word plural, not the message, just the message, the words, my words, that's important. My words shall not pass away. Peter, let's have a look at 1 Peter please, chapter 1. I'm wrapping up in a moment. 1 Peter chapter 1. And verse 23. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. 
for all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man is a flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. So Peter in verse 23 says that the word of God is incorruptible. I always remember Herbert Rausch many years ago preaching on the incorruptible blood from the same chapter. And he said incorruptible blood just has to be somewhere. Many teach that it dripped into the ground. The Saviour's blood just dripped into the ground. Incorruptible blood, and it's in, it is incorruptible, just has to be somewhere. And I believe the Bible teaches us that it's in the glory. The blood of Christ is in the glory. And the incorruptible word has to be somewhere. Some will say, you know, that thy word is forever settled in heaven, and it's in heaven. Well, the angels don't need it nearly so much as men do and God doesn't need it nearly so much as men do we need it down here and I believe it is down here incorruptible means that the words of God cannot be perverted so you might say well you're always telling us that they're corrupt Bibles how does that work then well they're fakes aren't they but the true Bible remains the true Bible is there. The, the incorruptible word is always there. Many, men will make many fakes, but the incorruptible one remains. Because it cannot be corrupted. God gives some examples, but time is going, so I'm going to move over those examples. But if you want to make a note, if you're making notes, <coughs> examples of the preservation of God's word, Exodus 34, 1. Exodus 34, 1. And Jeremiah 36, 27 and 28. The first is in Moses' case and the second is in Jeremiah's. And in neither of those cases is God going to forget what he wrote the first time in the former copies. To close in, three great warnings in the Bible. Deuteronomy chapter 4. Deuteronomy chapter 4. What God said to Moses. And it's a challenging word. Challenging word for preachers. And really it should be a challenging word, I think, to every Christian. And certainly a challenging word to translators. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 2. Ye shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall ye diminish aught from it. Moses was to give the word that God had given to him. He was to take nothing away and he was to add nothing to it. And that should be the watchword for every translator. That should be the watchword for every preacher. We do not add to God's word and we do not take anything away. We do not add the commandments of men and we do not remove the word hell such as they do in the Old Testament of the NIV, for example. Paul says, I have not shunned to declare unto you the whole counsel of God. And again, you know there's lots of preachers that just will not do that because they want the folks back next week they want to keep flying their jets and all the rest of it and their, their Rolls Royces or whatever it is they have. So they've got to get those bottoms on those seats next week. So they'll butter the people up. But Moses is told, you shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall you diminish aught from it. That's the first warning at the beginning of the Bible. The next one we read a moment ago, let's go to Proverbs 30 again, in the middle of the Bible. Proverbs 30. Verse 5, every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. And then the final warning is in Revelation chapter 22. Revelation chapter 22. And verse 18. Revelation 22 verse 18. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book now 
one of the important lessons that we can learn from this is God knows who is taking words out and who is putting words in. In other words, he knows what he gave, he knows what he had written, he knows when men are adding words, he knows when men are taking words out, and he knows who they are, and it's a fearful thing, a challenging thing. Now, I don't believe as a Christian one can lose one's salvation. But nevertheless, I, I would be very, very reluctant to be a translator. Now, a man might loosely quote the Bible. He might, in a sense, translate a piece of scripture for somebody and say, you know, roughly this is what this passage says. But to say this is the Bible, that's a dangerous business. You, you cannot have two Bibles saying different things and say that neither of them is corrupt. They might both be corrupt, but you can't have two Bibles saying two different things and say that neither of them is corrupt. And that's what we find. I've been complaining about this for 35 years. You pick up a modern Bible and you find serious changes, very, very serious changes. And those translators have got, have got a fearful judgment to come, if not the judgment of Revelation 22. I know which one is pure. I know which English Bible God has preserved. I trust you do too. I trust you do too. So God will preserve his saints, he will preserve his city, and he will preserve his scriptures. Amen. Amen.